Well, good morning. Welcome to Southside Bible Church. If you are here for the first time, we'd like to welcome you and just grateful for you to be with us and to worship this morning. This morning is the start of remembering the Passion Week of Christ as he entered this earth to secure our salvation by dying on a cross, being buried, and being raised on the third day from the dead. And so I want to encourage you to slow down this week and spend some solid time with the Lord, just taking in how great our God is and how great is our salvation that he has freely bestowed upon us. So redeem this week. Tonight, we're going to have some members of the church leading us in music and song, journeying the cross to the, to the resurrected Christ. And so I encourage you to come be a part of that. And again, the Good Friday service and Easter Sunday. We're going to have donuts. So if you come at 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, there are donuts on uh, Easter morning. So what, what's better than the resurrection with a donut together with your brothers and sisters <laughs> in Christ? So as we begin the Holy Week... This morning, we are looking at a rich passage that should overwhelm really our minds and our hearts this morning on the deep, deep, deep mercy of our God. So if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 9. I'm just going to begin reading in verse 6 to set the context again. Paul said, it's not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Nor are they all children because they're Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac, your descendants will be named. And that is, it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Malachi 1, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he, God, has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. And you'll say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O Anthropos, man, who answers back to Theos, God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Let us pray. Father, these words are infinite, they're eternal, they're mighty, they reveal your glory. I pray now your spirit's delight is to shine a floodlight on Jesus Christ and by doing that to glorify the whole Trinity. And I pray now, Lord, as we gaze into these truths that your glory would fill Southside Bible Church. God, I pray that we would see these things truly. I pray that your spirit would teach us and reveal to our own hearts what should be the response to such amazing, lofty truth. So God, please minister to each individual specifically for what they need this next 45 minutes. So God, meet us and let this now be a time of worship to our God, I pray. Amen. Well, we've been working through Romans for the last few weeks. I guess we've been out of it for the last few weeks. We had baptisms, and what I'm going to preach today just didn't feel right at baptisms with all our visitors. Um, Then we had the communion table, 
Uh, thank you, Nate. What a beautiful message that was. And then this morning, we're going to go back into Romans for what I think is the climax, the, the culmination of all that Paul has been teaching as we've been studying through Romans chapter 9. And since it's been a few weeks, I just want to give you a brief review. Our outline, Romans 9, 6a, there's an accusation made, but it's not as though the word of God has failed. God, can, no one can separate you from his love. How is it that most Jews at the time this is being written have rejected their Messiah? They've been hardened. Did God fail as he made a covenant with Israel? Has the word of God failed to bring about what he promised? And then Paul gives an axiom in 9.6b, for they're not all Israel who are descended from Israel. You need to understand truthfully, God does not get children by a natural birth he gets children by a supernatural birth. Unless you're born again, you won't enter the kingdom of God. You're not born into the promise of God for salvation. You're born again into the promise of God. And then he begins his argument to prove this. And he goes into verses 7 through 13. He shows that Isaac was chosen and not Ishmael. God's going to bring about his promise by a baby to, uh, that comes from a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old wife who had been barren. And so he gets his children by supernatural means, God speaking it into being. And then he says, well, let's look at Jacob and Esau. They're twins before either was born or had done anything good or bad. My purpose, I chose uh, Jacob and not Esau. And we worked through that whole argument for a couple weeks. And then we moved into verses 14 through 21 called the antagonists. The antagonists. Paul's now taking on two big objections to sovereign election. And usually the first thing that comes to mind, if you understand it rightly, you think that's not just, that's not fair. They weren't even born, they hadn't done anything good or bad, and God makes a choice, he makes a distinction. And then secondly, how can he find fault? If he hardens Pharaoh, who can resist God's will? If he hardens someone, I, there's the argument, that just isn't right. Who could resist God? So in verses 14 through 18, we look at the first objection, and then in 19 through 23, we're looking at the second objection. So let's just review the first objection in verse 14. What shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? May Ginatoy, may it never be. Perish, don't even let your minds begin to move in that direction. Because God is righteous. And we looked at that definition that God's righteousness is his unwavering commitment to uphold the honor of his name and the greatness of his glory. He will always act for his glory and according to his attributes. So he will always uphold the most valuable thing in the universe and act accordingly, which is his glory, his name. The glory of God is the most valuable thing and God will always work unto that end. And in verse 11, he says, election is the only thing that accords with my purpose to glorify myself as a saving God. He said, faith is the only thing that accords with salvation, not works. And so if God's going to be the one who gives salvation and chooses whom he desires, the only thing that works is faith and election, the choice of God. And so to, <coughs> Paul will help us see by the bringing of Moses up, and Moses is being asked to deliver Israel from Egypt, and he says, God, show me your glory and, and the glory is revealed in verse 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion upon whom I have compassion. The glory of God is to have mercy on whomever he desires. That's the freeness of God. He's not bound by us or what we say or do. His, his glory is, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. So then in verse 16, it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, who does, but on God who has mercy upon sinners. And then Paul took on the other side of his manifested glory that he hardens whom he desires. If you'll look in verse 18, so then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. And in verse 17, he pulls out the example of Pharaoh. For the uh, Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you. Why did you do that? Why did you harden Pharaoh's heart? 
um, so, that, so that they would be delivered from uh, Egypt by these 10 mighty plagues and the Red Sea. And all of it was that my name would be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Paul, the summary of Paul's point, John Piper said, humans don't know enough to elevate our own sense of wisdom and values and justice to judge the Almighty of what he should and shouldn't do with his power and his purpose. And so I want you to look at this second argument. He hardens Pharaoh. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? And we began looking at that. He gave three answers. And in verse 20, he says, remember God's position. His position in verse 20, on the contrary, who are you, O Anthropos, this created one who answers back to Theos? So before the the answer takes place, I just want you to get in the right place. You're man, you're created, you're you're woman. He created you, and he's sovereign, and he's the, the God of the universe Just get back in the right place before we tell God how he has to act and how he has to run his kingdom and his purposes. Put yourself back in the right place. Verse 21, his prerogative, or verse 20. The thing molded now will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? So it's God's prerogative to take from the lump of humanity, of this fallen humanity, to take a lump and say, I'm going to redeem it or I'm going to harden it. And we're going to flush out this idea of hardening uh, as we did last week. But the third reason for his answer then to verse 19 is verse 22 through 23. And now he's going to give us more of an answer and he's going to show God's purpose for why he acts this way. And the third answer is in verse 22. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So Paul is now giving us the closest thing to a reason for why God does this. And so we have been invited into the potter's house. The wheel is spinning. And he says, vessels are being made. And there's vessels being made for honorable use, and there's vessels being made for common use. And now we come to verse 22 with a day, and it it means he's moving now from the illustration of the potter to its application. And now he's going to bring us into a greater workshop. He's going to bring us into the great potter's house, the divine sovereign God. And he brings us into that now, and he says, this God can make a vessel that's going to occupy glory and heaven and be in his presence for all of eternity. He he has the skill and power to make that happen. And then he can also make a vessel prepared for destruction of a place where the worm does not die and the torment goes up forever and ever. So one quick point as we begin, the word vessels here is in the plural. So we're not just looking at Pharaoh any longer. We are now looking at all the Pharaohs throughout history that will be hardened and used for God's purpose. And so I want you to come to verse 22 with me. What if God, and usually in the Greek, you have an if then, and we don't have a then in this passage. And most commentators agree that then has to be supplied saying, what if God, what, what, what if God, what, what, then what can man say about it if God wants to do it this way? The, the then is there can be no objection to how God governs his creation. If God wants to do it this way, then he does it this way. So what if God, although willing, because God desires or God wills, he desires to accomplish a purpose, And that is what we saw in Romans 8, 28. He works all things for good to those who've been called according to his purpose. And so in this verse 22, he has a purpose. And his purpose for vessels of wrath is to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known. So God has a purpose in hardening. And that is why God is the main verb. God is subject. Main verb is he endured. He endured Vessels of wrath that were prepared for destruction. The word, Greek word to demonstrate, to make known. <laughs> this purpose 
is the, the way God does what he does and why. And he wants to manifest something. He wants to reveal something in his, in his working, something that will point to the attributes of God, something that will show the power of his wrath, the purity of his justice, his power, his patience, and his mercy. He has a purpose to put on display his glory and the fullness of all of his attributes. The reason God acts this way, he tells us, is his glory. And he's acting this way to make known his excellencies of the fullness of who God is in this plan. So God does this, verse 22, to manifest his wrath, to show that he's a holy God and he's a just God. It's what we're crying out for as we're watching the deterioration of this world. Is Why is this going on? Why so much injustice? And we're crying for it. And God's saying, I'm going to manifest it. And we can't get our arms around this because when I study the doctrine of hell, it so violates my natural thinking. It seems severe and excessive in my flesh. And dare I say, because I don't see how holy God is and how just he is and how offensive sin really is and us choosing our own glory over his. I don't fathom it. I don't get it. I need to deepen in that. So here's what I'm seeing going on in this passage. God could have condemned the whole lump and been just right after the fall. It's his patience why he's waited to bring down his wrath on a rebellious world. Too many think God's patience is he doesn't care. He does. His power is holding back his wrath for the day of wrath. And so God does so, so that he can finish his wise, loving plan and his purpose for bringing creation into existence. He's, he's holding back wrath and judgment because he has this bigger plan, this purpose for what he wants to put on display. That's what's holding him back. And that's making known the fullness of his glory. The beauty of who our God is, is what his purpose is for. And so he allows the rebellion of his creation to gain force and intensity so that his victory is all the more glorious and his condemnation is all the more justified. We saw it in Romans 2, 4. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God is to lead you to repentance, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And we can see the example with Pharaoh. He could have destroyed Pharaoh at the first rejection. But his patience with Pharaoh and ten plagues was that his wrath was made known on a whole nation and his power as he swallowed him up in the Red Sea. And God's name was made known throughout the earth. So now God is enduring with much patience vessels prepared for destruction to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known. God is free to make a vessel to demonstrate his wrath and power. And to say it is wrong for God to give open display of his wrath is to imply that it's not glorious. God is not as he should be. God is righteous and he'll always act rightly toward exalting his glory. And justice and wrath exalts the glory of God. And we got to stay balanced. The, 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 the Greek this morning is unbelievable to keep us off falling off either the left or the right. So look with me to verse 22. They were prepared for destruction. And this is in what's called the middle passive. And, and so the middle passive is context determines whether it's middle or whether it's passive. And it can't be in the middle because it'll destroy the whole context. That would say that the clay is going to determine what it's going to be used for common or honorable use. Or, so that the clay is not the determiner. Remember Romans 9, 18, Esau, before you're born, before you had done anything good or bad. So it's not the clay determining. <clears throat> so the commentators are all in agreement. It's passive. The context demands passive. And what's going to be interesting in verse 23 is it's going to be active that he prepared us for glory. 
So when we're thinking about hardening, it's very, every word is, is inspired by God. It, it is passive how he does it, and then it's active how he saves. So it fits perfectly with what I said last week, is God doesn't harden you. It's a passive hardening. He just doesn't act. He just lets the car out of alignment go, and it goes and does its own thing. It's, it's active when God reaches in and pulls you out and draws you to himself and gives you a new heart and gives you faith and makes you all new. And this new heart just wants him. That is the most powerful, beautiful thing. It's active. And God hunted you down and he produced that in your heart and your life. Praise be to God. And the passive, he passes over us and he lets us go our bent way. You know what he gives you? what you want. You just keep choosing. I love sin. I want more of it. I want that. And God just lets you go in it. You want a little drink of sin? Here's your sip out of a 20-foot wave. Just keeps taking you down the way. A hardening. When God hardens, there's real fault. There's real guilt. There's real blame. There's real rejection. And it's just. And so I want you to don't miss this as we finish this section you have real sovereignty that God uh, makes from the lumps whatever he wishes or desires. But as he does the hardening, there's real fault and there's real patience in God, just like with Pharaoh. There was a real patience with him. So God, who prepared them for destruction, potter over clay, their condemnation will be just and they willfully will reject him with their free will. And they're going to be condemned. So you will be condemned if you're sitting here this morning because you chose to reject the Lord Jesus Christ after having him offered to you again and again and again. It's a real guilt. It's not just saying, God, you made me this way. You chose to be this way. And how that all works together, we bow to the truth because we can't tie it together perfectly this side of the fall, but the scriptures present both and we got to live in that balance. Now I want to move to the verse that got me out of bed this morning excited. I believe this unlocks the whole chapter 9. And it answers a whole lot of questions that have come up or will come up. <clears throat> Why does God endure with these vessels of wrath passively prepared for destruction? Why does God put up with Putin and Hitler's and Stalin's and just sinners? Why does he do it? Well, in Revelation, his wrath is going to be revealed. It's going to be poured out like never before on this ungodly world. And it's going to mask more of his power than reveal it. Nahum said, who could stand against his power and judgment? The answer is no one. Why would God create vessels to come under such wrath? And Paul says the answer is for the glory of his name, to exhibit the full extent of his wrath and his power. The day of judgment is coming upon the rebellious world to its creator. In Revelation 11, they're going to be singing hallelujah that God has shown forth his glory in the world. The delay has come to an end and he'll be worshiped. But I want you to hear there's even a higher purpose of God in doing this and this should take your breath away. The grammatical structure of this is unbelievable. You have two infinitives in verse 22. And the, the purpose of to reveal his wrath and make his power known. And now we come into verse 23 and there's what's called a henna clause in the Greek. And it's just dropped in there. And that henna clause is what everything has been building to. The higher purpose for why the creator acts in this way. Vessels for honor and dishonor. Vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. Put your seatbelt on and listen to the answer. He did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. <sighs> henna. Paul doesn't give another infinitive. There's two of them in verse 22. The henna suggests that the purpose clause here is ultimate, and the two purposes are subordinate to this one purpose. One of the great commentators of all time, Cranfield, said, we now turn to the three statements of purpose contained in this passage. The last of these is, is, uh, is dominant, is clear. It alone is introduced by henna, and it's given special emphasis by its position in the sentence, by the fact that it is extended by means of the two relative clauses which follow, 
and the fact that in verses 25 through 29, further attention are given to it. So the ultimate purpose why God shows his wrath and power is to make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy. Lloyd-Jones says the various manifestations of all of God's attributes stand in the service of his mercy and thus function to heighten the revelation of his glory for the vessels of mercy and to intensify their appreciation of it. I don't know if you got what that just said. This is serving, all attributes are serving this mercy so that you can treasure and appreciate what God has given to you in salvation. Half-hearted Christians should not exist when you understand what we're about to look at. You know why there's wrath and destruction? So that the redeemed can fathom what you've been saved from. It's all working to show us what mercy really is. It was all given to us out of the freeness of God's will. And it's going to take all of eternity to keep revealing to you the fullness of God's mercy. And I just think maybe we don't treasure the mercy of God as we ought. And God has gone to such extremes to let us see it and revel in it as objects of it. I use that old illustration when you go in to, to buy a diamond. I guess you buy it online these days, but back when I was getting diamonds, man, you walked in and there was black velvet and the diamonds sat on them for a purpose so that those rings would just shine. And God is saying there's black velvet called wrath and destruction and justice so these vessels of mercy would know what God has shown to them. If there were no hell, if there were no wrath, and no destruction, there would be no amazement or awe at the mercy that God has shown you. It wouldn't demand my life, my soul, my all. When you read about the severity of hell, you want to turn your head. And it's to show the vessels of mercy what you deserved so that the mercy of God would be put on display. It breaks my heart what we're doing today with the doctrine of hell. It's now called just not enjoying the blessings of heaven and staying outside. I just say that is a lie. That is unscriptural. It's killing us. There's going to be a multitude gathered from every tribe, tongue, and nation who are going to fully understand the depth of our sin and what it is, fully understand who it was against, and understand what we deserved in eternal torment and the mercy that God gave that torment to his son on Calvary's tree. Now in glory, we're going to be made like him, with a new heaven and a new earth, joint heirs with Christ, God at the center of it all. It's just going to get better and better for all of eternity. And the reason is the sovereign grace of God and that his mercy endureth forever. Everything in history is working for that great climax. Vessels prepared beforehand for glory. Guys, this is what we were made for. Not for this world, not for your jobs, parents. You were made for his glory. To be able to see it and love it and behold it and not be destroyed. There's not a lot of boasting in being clay. It's what God did. He foreknew you, he predestined you, he called you, he justified you, and he glorified you. All that God did to make you a vessel of mercy. Romans 3, he put his own son up on a cross and he bore the full wrath of God in your place so he could show you mercy. His son got none so you could get all. That's what we're going to look at this week. I pray I drink it up this morning. Everything else those in hell are subservient to this great end of God, his freeness. What God showed Moses when he asked, show me your glory. I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. That's how big this section is. All of it hangs on a hint of clause, a little Greek word with an ocean of meaning. I'm going to put it right up there with but now and 321. 
I don't even need to say it. Tombstone, baby. <laughs> Hina. Hina. All of God's actions cohere to achieve one great end. The magnification of God's great glory for the eternal enjoyment of his chosen people. The fact that this purpose requires the demonstration of his wrath upon vessels of wrath will no doubt be disputed from, from the end of the ages. But for Paul, it was beyond dispute. And I think these verses say that God's wrath is put into the service of his mercy. So don't make this a cold laboratory. God doesn't say this one for honor, this one for dishonor. But this is setting his love upon you to make known all of his excellencies and all of his mercy for all of eternity. It is a love unparalleled. And dishonor is not a cosmic killjoy. This is a necessary end to make known my glory and showing mercy. And that's why it's a passive hardening. The Greek language in these verses should bring wonder, awe, and love that one is a passive, one's an active, and a little hint in closet to show the purpose of everything. Does that get you excited? Am I just weird? Yeah. Amen, I'm weird? <laughs> Thank you. Let's dig into the passage then. That was all introduction. No. Verse 23, he did so to make known the riches of his glory. And this is God's glory to make known the, the fullness of all his perfections, who he is, the, the riches of all that, the splendor and fullness characterizing these perfections of God. John Murray says it's that the perfections are magnified in the work of mercy and in no action is there so effulgent, splendid, an ex exhibition of God's glory than in this beautiful mercy. Why Moses began to bow to the ground when he revealed it. Paul said, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Isaac Watts said, now to the Lord, a noble song, awake my soul, awake my tongue. Hosanna to the eternal name and all his boundless love proclaim. So where it shines in Jesus' face, the brightest image of his grace, God in the person of his Son has all his mightiest of his works outdone. The spacious earth and spreading flood proclaim the wise and powerful God, and thy rich glories from afar sparkle in every rolling star. But in his looks, the glory stands, the noblest labor of thy hands. The radiant luster of his eyes outshines the wonders of the skies. The salvation of a soul is the most wonderful thing that God has ever done. Creation, wrath, and power all manifest, are manifestations of the glory of God, but it's eclipsed with what God has done in the redemption of man. Oh, the riches of his glory. You can't express it. They're unsearchable. His great love is unfathomable. Mercies, his breadth, height, depth, length, it surpasses understanding. This could be one of the brightest nuggets in the whole Bible. Romans 9. So here's what I get from Romans 9, 19 as I close this up. We're not just asked to submit blindly to a sovereign God. God's exercise of his sovereignty is, a pur is as purposeful as as the way a potter uses clay. And a potter can use clay to make evident the full range of his skill. And so it can only be right for God to deal with his people in such a way that the full range of his glory is externalized for us to see and behold and praise. And so what's the answer to verse 19? You'll say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resist his will? And the answer is it's perfectly fitting for God to work with his creation so that it will externalize all the aspects of his glory. On the one hand, his wrath and his power, and on the other hand, his mercy. I want to call some scholars to affirm these truths. Daniel Fuller, thus to show the full range of his glory, 
God prepares beforehand not only vessels of mercy, but also vessels of wrath in order that the riches of his glory in connection with the vessels of mercy might thereby become more clearly manifest. Thus it's surely right for God to prepare vessels of wrath, for it is only by so doing that he's able to show the exceeding riches of his glory, the capstone of which is mercy. For God not to prepare vessels of wrath would mean that he could not fully reveal himself as a merciful God. <laughs> John Piper it's right to unconditionally have mercy on one and harden another. It's right for God to be absolutely sovereign over all wills and all running. Because in this way, he displays most fully the glory of God, including his wrath against sin and his power in judgment so that the vessels of mercy know him most completely and worship him most intently forever as these objects of mercy. And now put your thinking cap on for the last quote by Jonathan Edwards. He's not easy, but he's beautiful. It's a proper and excellent thing for infinite glory to shine forth. And for the same reason, it's proper that the shining forth of God's glory should be completer. That is that all parts of his glory should shine forth that every beauty should proportionably be effulgent, radiant, that the beholder may have a proper notion of God. It's right to show the fullness of who God is. And it's proper that, that one glory should be exceedingly manifested and another not at all. Thus, it's necessary that God's awful majesty, his authority and dreadful greatness and justice and holiness should be manifested. But this could not be unless sin and punishment had been decreed. So that the shining forth as the others do, and also the glory of his goodness and love and holiness would be faint without them. Nay, they could scarcely shine forth at all without him. And if it were not right that God should decree and permit and punish sin, there could be no manifestation of God's holiness in the hatred of sin or in showing any preference in his providence or godliness before it. There would be no manifestation of God's grace or true goodness if there was no sin to be pardoned and no misery to be saved from, how much happiness soever he bestowed, his goodness would not be so much prized and admired and the sense of it would not be so great. Whew. We're on holy ground. I'm just going to make a little application and we'll just close out. Unfortunately, I have 16 points of application. <laughs> and I'll stop at a certain time if I don't. I'm, I'm, I more want bullets to just think on all of this. And let me just pray. Father, what we just looked at is overwhelming. God, it takes breath away. It struggles with our own human reasoning. And yet your glory is why you designed all of this. And you will always righteously work for that glory. God, I'll never be able to get over that there's a hell so that I could understand what mercy was in the saving of Jesus Christ. God, we praise you and we thank you and we worship you. I pray now, apply these to your children. Amen. I just think that we need the glory of God to shine forth from his word to our hearts rather than pep talks, slogans, catchphrases, and cool illustrations. If we spent hours and meditated on all this, where Edward's writings came from, it would take care of a million different problems. And we need to quit wanting little blogs and quick thoughts and the woman's five-minute study Bible. And we need to think on these things and go look at them and marvel and worship and understand them. Secondly, I'm tired of letting America dictate who God is instead of his word. What I just preached to you is the most un-American thing that you could ever preach, but it's God's truth. And we got to fight being not being conformed to this world, but renewing our minds and the truth of God's word. Third, the ultimate purpose for the universe is that God's glory would be seen and treasured and valued and praised that vessels of mercy 
would be able to deeply and truly see the beauty of the mercy bestowed upon them by their God. Let that do something to you. Do you treasure mercy the way that you should? Treasure this gift. Fourth, without wrath and power, God could not be fully seen for who he is. It just shows his glory. Fifth, see the heinousness of exchanging the glory of God for sin and lust and created things. Everything has been created for this glory, and God has done everything necessary for us now to love that glory and want to put it on display. And I've just been sick to my stomach all week, just what sin is. Sin is exchanging that for some lesser glory. I want to eat this food, look at this, be angry. You know, all these things are just taking a lesser glory called you and wanting people to love you and praise you and adore you. All the things, like see sin for what it is. Exchanging the glory of God, which is why everything exists, for lesser glory. And that was Romans 1, why all of the Gentiles were condemned. Because glory was manifested and, and it was suppressed. And said, I, I want much to be made of me and much to be made of his creation. We could do a whole sermon on that one. Number six, let this truth do what it should. This should never puff you up and make you haughty and make you look down on other people and make you not pray. Paul's going to close this section out and pray. And he hurry began it with saying, I wish I could be a curse that you could be saved, Israel. Care and have compassion for the lost. The gospel is what saves. Not share. Don't send missionaries. Don't worship and praise God. That's what everything comes out of this chapter. From him, through him, and to him are all things. Don't, don't let this truth make you haughty, cold-hearted, arrogant, hyper-Calvinist, nasty, snotty humble you before God and praise him forever that he showed you mercy. Nothing in you that did it, just freeness of God. That's got to do something to the human heart and mind. Number seven, does this section affect then your world and life view? Do you get out of bed and all I want to do is spread a passion for this glory? I want to tell of the gospel of mercy. I'm so overwhelmed with the gospel of mercy. I just walked in to get some kombucha. You ever had that? It's good. And the lady who's one of the owners, her and her husband were there, and, they're, and she's from Ukraine. And I said, how's it going with all your family members over there? And she says, I'm just struggling with why God would allow this. And then we were in church. And there was like 10 customers and just preaching the gospel, telling about mercy, all these things in Romans 9. I'm telling you, this should get a hold of your heart where all you want to do is proclaim mercy. A bunch of you were here yesterday, 30 volunteers preaching the mercy of God to children. Hallelujah. You just, you got to speak of it. And so let, let just be overwhelmed with mercy and want to tell this gospel to anyone, everyone. I've been mercied by God and it's offered to you. Come to Jesus. There's mercy, abundant mercy overflowing. It's not the best kept secret <laughs> it's to be told. Eighth, we're getting there. Be vibrant and joyful worshipers of our God that you are an object of mercy. All they should do is hit that piano key one time and praises come to the lips of his people that I've been shown mercy. Like I, if that isn't enough to motivate worship, you don't understand the gospel. Ninth, freely you have received, freely give. You've been shown mercy, go show mercy. Go show mercy to anyone, everyone that you can. I just drink up this mercy and I just want to show it to all people and tell them of a merciful God. I'm going to skip a few. Number 11, I've never come to a deathbed ever and heard someone say, I'm so glad I stored up treasure on earth and I got that house over the ocean. You were made for glory. Grow in it Deepen in it, spend time in it, turn off your TVs. You were made for God's glory. Know it, 
Seek it. Twelve, this whole section was a cry for justice. Is this just to be treated fairly? If you get treated fairly, you would be damned. And I just want you to be overwhelmed that you've been treated with mercy. Next, don't presume upon the mercy of God. I just have young people presuming and I'm going to wait till I'm older. I'm going to sow my oats. Guys, if this tells me anything, salvation is not on your terms. It's on God's. And that needs to wake you up. We don't play with God and decide when we want this. We cry to God for mercy. Praise God, it's his glory to show mercy. But I pray, don't make that mistake where I've seen more kids given over and they never want God. Don't play with that. For those who are not saved, I've had you ask me, I don't know if I'm one of God's elect. And the only way you know is if you'll come to Jesus because you're weary and heavy laden and he'll give you rest for your soul. Do you have faith? Have you come to him as the only remedy for your sin? That is how you know if God has chosen you. And then I want to get real honest because I want to talk about what your real struggle is with this doctrine. I struggle with it. I feel like I lost control. (laughs) My free will is what saved me. My baptism, my decision, my writing my name in my Bible cover and coming down the second stanza of just as I am, that, that's it. That kept me, I felt in control. I liked it. And now, Pastor, you're saying it, it's whether God has acted upon me in mercy. It's whether he's caused me to be born again to a, to a living hope. Has he given me faith? And so I spent all my time saying, was I sincere enough when I threw that twig in the fire? When I sang Kumbaya, did I mean it? And so I'm going to walk the aisle again to make sure. And I just kept trying and trying because I just didn't feel assured. But now I come to not how sincere was I, but has God saved me? Did he give me life? And did he make me new? And this is pulling the carpet out from under some of you who have never been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you walked an aisle and you prayed a prayer. And I'm telling you this morning, That doesn't save. Repentance and faith in Jesus Christ is what saves. And I want you to look that in the face this morning and not try to think back to some decision. But what's the state of my heart as I sit here this morning? Do I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And then I got such a good message for the one who says, I'm just too great of a sinner. There's no hope for me. Friend, God's glory is to put on display his mercy by forgiving the greatest of sinners. Paul said, I'm the the poster child. I was killing Christians and I received mercy from God. It's all based on him. You're right. You have nothing to merit his salvation. So what you've done in the past, what you're going to do in the future, what you're going to promise to do will not get you mercy. You can bring nothing but simply cling to the cross of Jesus Christ this morning. Have you seen that God can now be just and justified by forgiving you of every sin because he punished his own son on a cross? He gave him justice so he could give you mercy this morning if you would call upon him and believe in his name. God can choose to put mercy on you and not violate himself as the glory of the gospel. Come to Christ. Throw down your sin and surrender this morning. Don't let sin keep you from his mercy in Christ Jesus. The hymn writer said the only fitness he requires is that you feel your need of him. If you're a sinner this morning, Jesus says, come and I will save you and give you life. Let's pray. Father, those are, those are hard, difficult, beautiful things that we just looked at. And I pray now, I love these, this body so much. Help us to digest it. Help us to ask our questions. Help us to wrestle. Help us to worship. Help us to just receive and treasure and love and believe. And so we need you to do all of these things in our heart. But Lord, there is a glory in this room from a henna clause that you do all these things so that the vessels of mercy would know the fullness of what you have given to them. 
God, who's worthy of such a salvation. To your name we give glory, praise, and honor. God, I pray for any unbelievers here this morning. Let nothing keep them from Christ. There is an offer of mercy from the creator of the universe who pierced his own son on a cross for their sins. God, let them come. Let them come to Christ, weary from all their sin and trying to clean up and change their nature. God, let them finally just come with nothing and come to Christ and receive everything by faith. God, I pray, work mightily among us this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.